Wowzers. What idiot would do that? What a mess. They look like being wired by a hamster. Oh man, this is horrible. It's just like soul destroying. What on earth DIY disaster. Is it half a day today, Jordan? Pardon? <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm trying to run a business at the same time as, you know, give me some slack here. Hello and welcome back to Artisan Electrics where we're here today with my boy John. I'm back on the tools, doing an EICR and there's a lot of future work that's going to be happening here. We're going to be doing a consumer unit upgrade, battery storage as well and an EV charging point. It's a little bit of a different one so I want to show you everything that's inside. I think you'll find it quite fascinating. Hope you enjoyed today's video where we'll talk through with you all of our little tips and tricks for EICRs and show you what we're planning to do here because there's a lot of work that we're looking forward to. But before we get into it, hit a thumbs up, subscribe and let's go. Today's video is brought to you by Tradeify. I'll talk to you about that in a bit. So just for our non-electrician viewers, an EICR stands for Electrical Installation Condition Report. It's basically a really in-depth test and inspection of an electrical uh, installation. We start at the consumer unit and we start with visual checks. So let me show you what's in here. So this is what we call a skeleton board, which is why it's a little bit unusual. We don't really have many skeleton boards in Cambridge, but down here in Essex, they have them a little bit more. Basically it's inside this kind of um, meter box enclosure thing, but it's in the house. All the wires come into it and it's got just a DIN rail with the main switch and stuff. So the interesting thing about this one is our customer here is a little bit obsessed with monitoring everything in his house. So he's put a CT clamp on every single circuit to be able to monitor the exact energy usage of each individual circuit. The tricky part for us now is doing an EICR is that the, he's taken the board cover off in order to fit all the CT clamps in, which technically means that this is really, you know, quite unsafe because there are live parts exposed. So this, this would be a C1 straight away. But we're coming here to do an EICR with other work in mind. So we've got a board change that we're going to do. We've got a Zappi charger that we're going to install and we're going to be putting battery storage in for him. So I'm kind of considering all of that as we do the EICR, knowing that we're going to upgrade this and we're going to tidy up these CTs. First glance, what I notice about this board is there's no RCD protection for any circuit. So that straight away is going to be potentially an issue because you've got socket outlets with no RCD protection that could be used outside. Nowadays, pretty much everything needs to be RCD protected. There's also no surge protection device here. So that's something that we'll need to note on the report. And what we'll do now is we're just gonna go around and do a visual inspection first to see if there's anything that immediately jumps out at us that's unsafe. We're gonna look for the main earth bonding to the gas and water to see if that's in place and we're also as we go around going to plan our install for when we come back to do the other work. So it's worth pointing out to any learners that this is a 3871 type MCB so when you're trying to date a fuse board they, these sort of got phased out in 1989 was replaced by the 60898 and it's different, so rather than type B, C and D, you've got type one, two and three, as you can see here. And they, they don't have as higher rated um, Max ZS, but it's a good way to sort of start carbon dating the fuse board and to tell when it was built and when it was uh, installed. And then you can see some new colors here. So there's been some upgrades. And then the M numbers, they don't have KA, they have M rather than... So M6 means it's 6K. A lot of them will be M3s, M4s. It does actually have a label on the side saying this type tested to BS3871. And they've completely removed the tables of 3871 out of the regs book now, haven't they? So you can't even kind of... So does that mean you're supposed to blanket fail them? They've removed the 4293 RCD as well. Yeah. Let us know, guys, in the comments, for you, you, those of you who are, you know, electricians who do EICRs a lot, how would you code it now if it's a 3871 MCB or a 4293 RCD? Would you fail it or would you just put a note on there? We'd love to know all your comments. 
So this is the main cutout fuse. This is a little bit of a new one for me. It looks quite different to the ones that we're used to around Cambridge. John reckons that it might actually be a 40 amp fuse in there. And they've put new tails in, but the new tails are only 16 mil. So it's definitely not gonna be more than a 60 amp fuse in there for sure. It's on a looped supply as well. So under here, you can see that there's a cable coming in and a cable going out. That means that this supply is shared with one of the neighbors potentially, which means that they're not gonna be able to upgrade that potentially to a 100 amp fuse without unlooping the supply, which can be quite complicated and expensive. So we'll definitely have to put active load management in to make sure that the EV charger doesn't blow the main fuse if we can't get it upgraded. I'm learning a lot today from John because he used to work for the DNO, so he knows all the little inside secrets that only the DNO guys know. And one of them is this little blue nodule here, this little blue thing shows that it's on the blue phase, this particular supply. So in the past, the phase colors were red, yellow, and blue. So blue would be L3. Now we have brown, uh, black, and gray. So gray is now L3. So we're gonna go around now and do what we call a long wander lead test or R2 test. It's basically where we use this on the low ohm, low resistant ohm setting, continuity test setting with this long green lead, which allows us to go around and just dab our tester onto anything that's metallic that we think should be earthed. Metal light fittings, main, you know, main water, main gas bond. And we can just do that now as we go around doing our visual checks. So this one, if we touch one of the fixing screws, we're getting a nice low reading and my tester's making a racket. And then this wall light here, absolutely nothing. So it's a quick and easy way to show whether things are earthed, especially class one equipment like this. So what we're doing now is we're checking the main earth bonding connection to the water pipe, which is usually next to the main stopcock for the water. And the main stopcock for the water is usually in an annoying place like under the sink. So um, we found the main stopcock, we'll show you that in a second, and it, it does look like it's a copper pipe coming in, doesn't it? It from, is, yeah. From the ground. I can't see a bonding conductor on there. No, but this is why it's important to carry out a wonder lead check because just because you can't see it doesn't mean it's not there. Yeah. So there's this rule of thumb of 0 0.05, which is nonsense, it doesn't exist. It's just a number that, this rule of thumb that seems to have just developed over the years. Apparently it was a number that was in the 16th edition, but you'd have to carry out, know the length of the cable to know the resistance of that cable, to know what the reading should be. But as a rule, if it's low enough, you can assume it's bonded. So this one here, and we are getting 0 0.03. So does that mean you think it is bonded somewhere? I would say so. There's about four cables leaving the board. It might be a case that they go up to the immersion cupboard and link across every single pipe, and that's yeah. the reason we're getting a low reading. However, if we're upgrading the fuse box, we're gonna have to um, upgrade the bonding as well, aren't we? Yep. So this will have to be upgraded to 10 mil. Um, it's gonna be tricky to get a 10 mil earth around to here as well. It is. The gas is there. I don't, we'll check if the gas is bonded, but yes. that might be an option to maybe, I don't know, do follow the same route that they've used for the gas bond. We've got um, some exposed live connectors there. It's fed via this plug, but still it's not very clever. If you have a look in there, you can get straight on that. Oh dear, it's not earthed. Okay. So this is a class one fitting that's not earthed. And as you can see, so the fact potential. It's, it's giving us a voltage reading, which means that you know there is potential between true earth and the casing of that fitting, which means it's definitely not earthed properly. So we do need to investigate that further because potentially someone could touch that, touch true earth and get an electric shock. Um, which is why all metallic parts that have the potential to come live under fault conditions need to be connected to the earthing system of the property so that they're all at the same potential difference. So 
It's like a socket, socket off the lighting mil, circuit. Yeah. It's like a daisy chain. We've got a spur into a light switch, to another spur, into a little vacuum socket. Ah, I smell, I smell the DIY disaster brewing here. Let's have a butcher's oh, yeah. here. You know when the customer's got a box of wires and connectors, you know when the customer's got something like that, that they like to do their own DIY electrics. <laughs> uh, but I did say the customer's got an electrical background of sorts, so it's not too surprising. So I'm trying to figure out what this switch fuse connection unit does. I turned it off thinking it might do the light, but it doesn't. I'm wondering if maybe it, it either does this burglar alarm panel or it does the uh, socket over here for the, for the hoover. But either way, it's just kind of a weird setup. So you've got this light, obviously, switch from this switch. You've got a fuse connection unit which comes off the light switch, which does the burglar alarm panel. So I can only assume that this fuse connection unit here just does the socket here for the Dyson Hoover. But it's all a bit of a weird configuration, really. Didn't the regs just change about uh, one mil with sockets? Ooh, I don't know. I'm pretty sure that Dave Savory mentioned something about you're not allowed to have one mil feed in the socket. It used to be 1.5, but it might have just changed in the regs. I'd have to read it up to double Ooh. check. Okay, that could be interesting. So this lighting cable here is a little bit one, of one millimeter squared cable that's spurred off this socket to feed the switch fuse connection unit for the cooker hood. Now this is a bit of a tricky one because it's on a fuse switch fuse connection unit. So technically that piece of cable is never gonna pull more than three amps or five amps or whatever size fuses in that switch fuse connection unit. So it could have actually been designed this way. Like I spoke to an NIC EIC inspector about this and he said, well, somebody might have designed it that way that you know that cable is fine for for that specific load because it's protected by a fuse and the fuse protects this cable as well. Let me know your thoughts about that because my gut feeling is I just don't like it but at the same time what is the actual risk of anything going wrong with that? What would you say John? It's a hard one really because I mean that clip direct can take around 13 amps so even if you misfused it mm. it could still potentially take 13 amps then it depends on the load as well. Is it a resistive load? Or, I mean, if it's got a motor in it, then it could f fault and overload. It's not purely resistive, is it? So I don't know. Probably a C3, I'd, I'd say probably not a C2, um, just because the actual risk of something going wrong with it is very minimal. Yeah, I'd go for a, a C3, but I'm probably gonna whip the uh, spur off and check what fuse is in it as well. So this is the cooker switch. And immediately we have an issue which is single insulated conductors that are visible outside of the enclosure. That's not acceptable. So that would be a C2. Um, and I'll talk about the classification codes in a minute for those of you who don't understand what they are. I'll explain what those are. But then they spurred off this cooker switch with a bit of 2.5 millimeter squared twin and earth to feed this 32 amp commando socket, um, which is being used to run a compressor in the garage. So it's all a little bit Heath Robinson and I would definitely be recommending that that gets sorted out because this bit of 2.5 twin and earth is not strong enough to take 32 amps on a continuous basis. So when it comes to classification codes on an EICR, there are basically four codes. C1, which is you can see it, you can touch it, and it's da immediately dangerous, you could be killed, you know. Uh, C2 is basically, it's, it's potentially dangerous, so one thing would need to happen for that to become dangerous, like that single insulated cable that's visible. All it would take is for someone to slash that by mistake, and then copper would be exposed, a live conductor would be exposed, and there would be a problem. C3 is basically, doesn't comply with the regulations, it recommended improvement, but it's not, immediately or potentially dangerous. It's just a kind of a technical non-compliance. And then FI means further investigation. That is when we find something that looks a little bit suspect and we think I need to investigate more into that, but I don't necessarily have time to do that today as part of this EICR. So I'd recommend that somebody comes back and does further investigation on that. So like today, this light fitting that we found that's not earthed, if we've got time, which we will do today, we'll take the fitting down, have a look and see why it's not earthed 
and if it's an easy fix we'll just fix it but if you were in a bit more of a rush and you didn't have time you could put further investigation on that and then recommend somebody comes back to do that further investigation so there should be supplementary bonding in here so there would have been a bonding wire four mil coming from the lights or any circuit in here there's nothing visible but again i'm getting a low reading but i'm pretty sure the supplementary bonding isn't in place we'll have a look up in the loft and see if we can see a four mil coming off of any of these The worst I've seen is probably a, a whole house wired in speaker wire and that's the sort of see-through one with the copper braid inside and that was the whole house, every single socket, all of the lighting, everything there and I try to implore the client, like say to them, you need to disconnect this, it's so, so dangerous but we don't have the power to switch off as electricians, so all we can do is issue a danger notice, so unfortunately that's what I did and they left it as is. Worst thing I've seen was actually a marijuana grow that I got called out to where they had, they'd bypassed the main cutout fuse, they'd just like put a copper pipe in there or something to keep, so that, and then they bypassed the meter so they weren't paying for the electricity and they could take like hundreds of amps of power and then they put like massive banks of sockets in every room where they wired off with these contactors and stuff for all the lights to to power this marijuana grow it was absolutely nuts um, it got raided by the police basically and i got called out to do a sort of safety check on it but yeah it was it was crazy and talking of marijuana grows looks like our customer's growing something in here oh how disappointing it's only tomatoes I like the uh, sort of iPad lay there and look up and watch something on your iPad. I mean, we're going to be putting batteries in a lot, so like three, uh, three 5.8 kilowatt batteries we're putting in, so it'll be like 15, 16 kilowatt hours of batteries. So in here, the, this bathroom, there are various items of electrical equipment in here. There's no RCD protection for the bathroom, which there should be, or there should be supplementary bonding, basically, an earth wire between every kind of metal casing of every item in the bathroom. So that would be like from the shower to the pool cord to the lights. But another note, they have an electric shower, which is gonna to add to the demand of the property. So we're thinking about maximum demand calculation. How much is the maximum amount of power the customer's gonna to need uh, to be taking at any one time? That's already like at least 32 amps. It's a, um... oh, it's a 10.5 kilowatt shower. So that's like 40, 45 amps. Um, of power that that shower is going to take plus if they've got an EV charger that's another 32 amps you're already at over 70 amps of maximum demand without anything else and as you can see he's got quite a powerful computer he's got this kind of growing system for his tomatoes there's a lot of power being consumed in this house so maximum demand is going to be an issue when it comes to installing an EV charger you just never ever see oh, that's really exciting it's a hood for the downlight to stop and contain like fire and, and heat in there. But you just never, ever, ever see them. They're always just warming up the lagging. So we used to have to shove these fire hoods up through the hole and kind of fold them out around the downlight because you had these halogen downlights that got super hot and the fire hood was supposed to kind of maintain the fire barrier of the ceiling and stop that heat from burning stuff above the ceiling. But now we just put fire rated downlights in much easier. So welcome to the loft. We're checking the electrics up here, but particularly we're looking at the solar inverter because we're going to be installing about 15 kilowatts of battery storage up in this loft later on. So we're gonna be changing this to a hybrid inverter and then putting three banks of 5.8 kilowatt hour batteries along here. So I'm kind of going to be measuring up and stuff while I'm here as well to plan the battery install. But the actual solar install looks like it's been done pretty well. You've got two strings. Um, it is producing a decent amount of solar right now. It's producing 1.85 kilowatts uh, by the looks of it. So I mean, it's a quite a sunny day. So it's obviously not a massive solar array, but it's certainly enough for them to be able to charge their batteries up during the day and then be able to use that power to run the house during the night. So we just found this bit of old rubber cable. You can see it's quite malleable still. It ain't perishing, but the inner cores are. So you can see as you even touch it, it starts breaking apart. 
And that's why when we find them on EICRs, best thing to do is just leave it alone because you're just going to create more faults and uh, recommend a rewire. So we've got this battery bank called the Jackery, which we use to just keep the Wi-Fi router running. Um, so we're ready now to turn the power off for the main house, but it means that the customer can still work from home on their laptop. They'll still have good Wi-Fi because we keep the router running using this power bank. And what is that? I mean, what on earth happened there? Oh, it's just, uh, that's definitely a DIY disaster. Right, Look at that as well. <laughs> yeah, that's, I've got pictures of that one as well. I'll take pictures of everything I find so that's right on the report after. Yeah, absolutely. So I've done my PFC, live neutral and uh, live to earth. I'm now disconnecting the main earth to get our ZE reading, a true ZE with the bonding conductors disconnected. For our viewers who aren't technically minded, PFC stands for Prospective Fault Current. That's basically the maximum amount of current that can flow in the event of a fault. And ZE is the external earth fault loop impedance path and the resistance of the external earth system, basically. So this is a TNS system, so the earth's coming off the sheath. So the maximum we can have is 0.8. Um, in reality, everything's uh, PME in London, to be honest, but it's coming off the sheath, so we're going to say it's TNS. Wowzers. So there's some serious bang bang happened there at some point where um, some shorting out has happened and some minor explosions have occurred in the board. Don't know who did that, but I hope they, I hope they survived <laughs> it to tell the tale. <laughs> Several times the copies have been able to say, I mean, what idiot would do that, to be honest? Why would you poke a screwdriver in like that? I have no idea, but that's shorted out and gone boom, boom. So this is how I'll do a global IR. I'll have my line and neutral link together, all of my MCBs on, go at 250 first, and then up to 500. I mean, the megas would normally uh, reduce the voltage anyway. So I'm getting about four mega ohm. And I know for, if I put that up to 500, it's gonna go down to zero. You think? Uh, I, I'm gonna- Can we do that without frying anything? Oh, it's holding, to... it's holding. Yeah. That's great. And the, the question is on that though, do you think that that's kind of lower because they're all connected together? And therefore, what would you put down on, on the report? Would you just put that for every circuit? I personally or? would do that as a global IR because yeah. the global IR is the, the maximum is one yeah. Yeah. mega ohm. And then that is a pass. Yeah. I mean, we could we can do these individually now, just out of curiosity yeah. to find out which one's doing it. Because I would say that if we do them individually, we'd probably get off the scale individually so i'm just going to check them live earth not neutral so solar pv is clear yeah sockets are bringing it down because there's loads of stuff plugged sockets in sockets bringing sockets. it down i mean that is good enough to basically say it's a pass anyway isn't it but Ooh. i'd like to see them all off the scale so yeah. what i would normally do is go around and unplug everything disconnect turn off the switch fuse connection units and stuff to try and clear any connected equipment and then that'll probably improve the readings quite a lot IR, which is what we're talking about, stands for insulation resistance. It's basically a test where we put voltage down the circuits, a test voltage, and it will tell us the resistance of the insulation in the cables and the electrical systems. We want to make sure that there's no breakdown in that insulation so that there aren't any um, dodgy kind of shorts and things in the cables. That's why we're doing this test. This light wasn't earthed when we did the test, so that's why we're taking this particular one off, just to see what's going on behind here. Oh well, there we go, I found the problem already. So I've taken this cover off this light and you can see right away here, the earth wire is just hanging. So that is why it's not earthed. So we can reconnect that fairly easily. Uh, we'll just do that right away while we're here and then we don't even need to mark it down on the report. Yeah, it is class two, yeah. So the reason this light is not earthed is because it is class two, so it's got the double insulated symbol there. 
so it doesn't actually need to be earthed. The only thing about these is usually when they are class two, they provide you with this special little connector block thing that is like double insulated and you're supposed to use that, but they're really tricky to use. So people end up doing it like this in a connector block. And then I feel like that kind of removes the whole class two protection really, because this is metal, you know, that is okay, that's insulated, but not very well. So I don't really know whether it's kind of breached the class two rules now this fitting or not. So I've just taken another one of these down just to check and again it's the same and they've just cut the earth off they've not connected them together so inside these cables they're not actually earthed so we'll just need to cut these off re-terminate them put some fire rated down lights in but uh, that, that's a job for another day yeah all the inner cores have been cut out and you've got 2.5 in the load side and these cores have been cut out to make it fit in all honesty they would have fitted it's so close to pulling out it's really rough. So dodgy, look at those earth wires, they've just come complete, like they're, they're not connected at all, they're just completely loose, not even twisted together properly, they're just, what a mess. Let's go upstairs, we'll take a couple of switches off upstairs. Again, they've cut the wires really short here, they've not sleeved the earth. It is actually in the earth terminal, this one, but there's a spare cable as well dropped down here that's not doing anything. They're all the same, these switches, they look like they've been wired by a hamster. So I'm here in the bathroom just taking the isolator switch down for the shower and I found something a little bit crispy. Let me show you. So these neutral wires are supposed to be blue but they've actually gone black because they've been overheating and you can see the actual plastic casing of the switch is getting a bit yellow as well. They've just been overheating, probably overload or a slightly loose connection maybe and they've got so hot that they've actually blackened the insulation of the wires. So. That is definitely a bit dodgy. Has it just been taped up or is it? No, that one's... They have wrapped tape around some of them, but... Yeah. No, I mean, that's... That's, um, that's not tape, that's just complete chard. So this is, I presume, a switch for the outside light that's just on the other side of the wall here. But it's got two lighting cables, one in and one out, so I'm not quite sure what that's all about really, but I think it might be fed from that socket, so I'm gonna have to maybe take that socket off and just have a look. This house looks like it's been rewired by a chimpanzee. Is it half a day today, Jordan? Pardon? <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'm trying to run a business at the same time as, you know, give me some slack here. You're supposed to be doing this EICR on your own. I've come to help you, you should be grateful. <laughs> Oh man, this is horrible. <laughs> Look at that. I just want to. I just want to re-terminate this socket. There's like everything that you could possibly ever have wrong with how to terminate a socket has been done here. They've not stripped the cables back properly, so you've got really short little lengths here. You've got loads of exposed copper. They've sleeved the two earth wires together in one sleeving. They've twisted them together. Then the, the earth fly lead to the back box is like just pulled out. It's just like soul destroying. I think I'm going to re-terminate this and then just be done with it. Putting my R1, R2 link in on my sockets. It's not a ring here, it's a radial circuit. And uh, I'm going to go around every point because I can't really tell what is end of line and see what readings I get and record the highest. And then I'll do the same again when it's all turned on. So when it comes to running an organized trades business, it's important to have systems in place for things like quoting and invoicing to save yourself time and ultimately money in the long run. And just to be organized so that you have a smooth workflow process. And that's why we use Tradeify, who've kindly sponsored today's video. So right now I'm actually looking on Tradeify, the quote that I've already provided for the customer for the consumer unit upgrade, because I just wanted to check the dimensions of the consumer unit that we've planned to install so that while we're here, we can make sure that that consumer unit is gonna actually fit. So massive shout out to Tradeify. Thanks for sponsoring today's video. There's a link in the description where you can get 50% off Tradeify for your first three months using our special code. So we're gonna put a Zappi on here because he's got a hybrid electric vehicle coming soon. I'm gonna probably plan to run the cable there and then drill through into the consumer unit following similar route to the solar. So this is the solar power supply. 
which comes out and goes up into the loft. It's like a four mil twin and a half cable that feeds the inverter. So presumably if they've got that through, yeah, we can follow the same route through, through the porch. They've actually just run it through the porch and a bit of trunking here. And then they've just drilled through from here and gone into the consumer unit. So we can probably do the same with the, with the uh, Zappi cable. So I'm just measuring up for the new board just to make sure that the Wilex skeleton board that we've got on order is actually going to fit. So it's like 33, 30, about 33 centimetres wide here. And then depth wise, we've got about 20. So I'm just going to check on the website now and see what the dimensions are. So this is why EICRs are so important because you just never know what you're going to find when you start digging into an electrical installation like this. As you can see from today, we found quite a lot of dodgy stuff, which if we were just doing the board change now, and then we were discovering all that, suddenly the customer is going to come to the realization that there's a lot more work and expense needed that's going to happen later. And potentially you can't reconnect circuits because it's not safe to do so. Whereas if we do, all the EICR testing now we can then provide a report to the customer which is very clear with pictures and a list of all the things that are not ideal that need fixing and then a cost with that so that they know exactly where they stand and then obviously we can do those remedial works alongside the board change and the other works that the customers requested. We love our customers. Customers made us an amazing lunch. Delicious pasta with smoked salmon and um, a lot of flavour. Hats off to our customer. There is an earth here. So this was just sticking out before. So there's no continuity and there's nothing, no continuity down at the switch. It's because these two need to be joined together. I mean, this whole pendant needs re-terminating, to be honest. For whatever reason, they've just shoved the cable up in the ceiling. So I'll take that down and re-terminate it. So we're just finalizing things, getting all the paperwork done and stuff. We're not gonna go into depth on the paperwork side of things on this video, because we have done a full in-depth video about our certification paperwork and how it works, the software that we use. So I'll leave a link up here somewhere where you can look at that video. So we're just typing up the final report and doing an altered quote for all the remedial works and other bits and pieces that's going on here. Let us know if you'd like to see the follow-up video where we do the consumer unit change and the battery storage installation because it's going to be a little bit of an interesting follow-on from this. But I hope you've enjoyed today's video. If you have, don't forget to hit a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't done so already. And why not stick around and watch another video? There'll be some more great videos popping up on the screen soon. So grab a cup of tea and watch another one. But either Anyway, thank you and have a great day.